Welcome back, everybody, to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. In the podcast where we speak about the dark secret of cybersecurity, the dark and shady things about the cloud, and how to combat and, uh, and defend yourself and your organization as a proud cybersecurity defender against the shady stuff in the cloud. And today we have the pleasure and the fun to have a funny and sh- and 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 a couple of laugh with Tom Langford. Um, that is always a good joke. So I'm uh, sorry for the excessive laugh and uh, sometime jokes, but uh, I hope you enjoy. Hello, hello, Tom. Hello. What a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very I love much. The t-shirt. Thank you, thank you. Always, always an Archer fan. Um... <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you like Kenny Loggins? Because you've just entered the danger zone, as he most I famously said. Danger, danger zone. <laughs> so, yeah, so it used, to be, used to be my favorite thing to say, danger zone. But <laughs> yeah, then I had to explain the whole thing. So yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I start getting out, so I only use it at conferences now. <laughs> Absolutely, I did sneak it into a panel once at Infosec. I did sneak an, an Archer quote into a panel, um, which was uh, I was very pleased with, to say the least. I mean, blank looks from the audience, but you know. I think they thought, like, <laughs> but that's the problem. You had to go. Yeah. You had to go and explain what Archer is, why it's funny, and then I know. The joke kind of dies. <laughs> I know he's not supposed to be a likable character. That's the point. You know? No, but not everybody. Uh, not everybody understands sarcasm in these modern words. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. My anyway. my view is: Why would I insult people that I don't like? It's a waste of energy. Let's insult people that I love and enjoy to be around. <laughs> so at least you can start a conversation. Yeah, and also <laughs> you can build longer and longer levels of of um, of insults as well. You know, <laughs> over time. You know, whereas with people you don't like, you say it once, you never see them again. Yeah, uh, there was a, a friend of mine, a Russian friend of mine, that says, "What's the point of agreeing into a conversation or having a calm and relaxed conversation? It's not fun, and it's not going to lead to anywhere." <laughs> there is that. There is that. Let's oh. disagree on anything. So we. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Although I have to say, it does sound does sound to be quite exhausting. Yeah, in, in the long run, but it was it was a fun session. I think the Greek the Greek used to used to run with that as a conversation start and as an exercise. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it and, sounds, and sounds very philo- philosophical. Yes, disagree on everything just for the sake of conversation. Well, it exercises the brain, if nothing else. In fact, I, I got known uh, initially when I sort of first started to get engaged with the InfoSec industry. I got known as somebody who didn't believe in um, awareness and education in InfoSec because one of the very first things I was asked to do was to was to go on a debate about whether we should – um, do educational awareness in InfoSec or if it was a waste of time. And I got put on the the side that said it's a waste of time, even though I completely agree that we should be doing it. And so I put all this effort into trying to build a case as to why we shouldn't be doing it. All in the, all the meantime, thinking, I don't agree with what I'm saying at all. And then everybody thought I didn't want education and awareness. It was very frustrating, I have to say. <laughs> They agree to disagree with your disagreement, but you disagree yeah. fundamentally with your agreement. Exactly. I knew that they knew that I knew that they knew that I knew. Something that's like a, that. that sounds security 101. Like yeah. everybody not, yeah. not understanding yeah. and having a very intense conversation using acronyms. Absolutely. <laughs> Violently agreeing. <laughs> anyway, before we crack on, I love this conversation, how they flow. I love I love doing the panels with you because the conversation just flow. <laughs> but be, before we crack on, uh, welcome back, everybody, to the cloud, uh, Cybersecurity and Cloud podcast. We have the absolute pleasure to have one of my favorite panelists and one of my favorite uh, spokesperson in cyber, Tom Langford. you want to give an introduction about yourself, what you do, what you're up to of recent, Tom? Sure. My name is Tom Langford, and I'm a recovering CISO. Um, I uh, yeah was a CISO at a, a large a global company up until the beginning of last year. I then uh, left and set up my own consultancy, something that would have been unheard of for me three or four years before. Um, and everything was going really well until uh, this coronavirus hit. So... <laughs> <laughs> so next time I'm on the podcast, I'll be uh, underneath some railway arches, surrounded with cardboard <laughs> and uh, an open oil drum fire in front of me. 
Uh, but you know, I'll still be podcasting. Yes, I think that's that's the resilience for people that are resilient in this time and age. Yeah, yeah. We just, I, I, you know, in all seriousness, yeah, it's been it's been a real stinker because you know, as a, as effectively as a sole trader, um, you have to do everything in the business. You know, everything from the the marketing, the sales, you know, the back office, as well as the actual work. And so, I'd been putting a lot of effort into the pipeline. Just and the pipeline became very healthy and then virtually disappeared overnight as a result of the coronavirus. So I have to restart. So it's about survival. But, you know, I'm uh, you know, I'm not alone in this. I'm certainly, you know, certainly not unique in in either our industry or globally. It's a case of surviving for the next few months, which is all you know, it's it's looking fine. It's okay. Um, And uh, things look to be picking up. But, uh, yeah, any any other. um, um, you know, sole traders or, you know, small companies out there in similar positions, you know, solidarity, brothers and sisters. Yeah, no, I think I had a conversation with a few of my peers and uh, Jane as well, Jane Franklin. And we, it, it's good that the community is coming together to support each other and we try to help each other. So keep the yeah. channel open. <clears throat> don't think that you're alone in this. If you are an entrepreneur, if you're starting right now, just don't give up. Keep your idea. Absolutely. And, and what I, would... I keep on saying, what I keep on saying is even if, if, if you need to accept a job for a little while, go back, it's not a failure. It just, it is what it is. It's just yeah. coping with the situation that it is. And I would say if you're, you know, if you're part of a larger organization, you know, global or national or whatever, but a large, you know, successful organization, the best thing you can do for the community right now is employ us. Give us some work. <laughs> Show us the money, man. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll plaster your name. Make it rain. Make it rain, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Show you. Show you. Show some solidarity with us. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think right now everybody's in a kind of shell shock. And... Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's unprecedented, and you know, everybody's. It's all about preserving cash flow, understandably. Um, yeah, everybody's holding their pocket, and yeah. the problem is uh, also everybody's trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to go online and trying to, you know, try to cope with this in the best way they possibly can. I was having a conversation uh, with one of my good friends uh, and actually on the sideline I started reconnecting with a lot of old friends old people so there, there are is some a positive benefits. aspect in this yeah there are some benefits to it but he he's working in the in the um, public sector in Italy and he said everybody start working from remote and they have absolutely no clue about how to do secure zoom how to share credentials how to use applications so an organization don't employ don't know where to go for this yeah don't have a strategy they just right now everybody's in survival mode so we saw recent breaches without naming names uh but uh, we saw recent breaches of very sophisticated attack to be performed on certain airlines yep. and being <clears throat> breached we will see how sophisticated was the attack uh, and what's come after Not it sophisticated Probably social engineering and probably somebody forgetting an API open somewhere or credential or an SD. SQL injection. <laughs> or I would put money on it being SQL injection. <laughs> or cross-site yeah. scripting. One or the other. It's going to be 80% I've, chance one of those two. I've seen, I've seen even input validation to be completely, completely something unknown yep. to a lot of people. And, and yeah. well, when you're explaining, it's like it just take a string and you just make sure that is what you expect it is. Yeah. Well, it doesn't but help it, when um, that particular company in question, I saw something about their password um, requirements for when creating an account, and it was between 8 and 20 characters, um, no special characters, uh, were allowed uh, in there. It had to be uppercase, lowercase, or numbers, but no special characters. So you know, twenty characters and that limited, you know, that that significantly limited uh, scope of digits. Yes, it's still quite a large variation, right? But nonetheless, yeah. significantly smaller, exponentially smaller than if they included special characters and went up to one hundred and twenty characters. You know, and I suspect no multi-factor whatsoever. Um, the, the, the what? Sorry, um, yeah, <laughs> never heard of it. Never heard. Yeah, of I, it. I don't understand what is in day and age. We don't multi-factor everything. It's just the well, safest default, thing to right? do. 
It should be the default what? thing. And um, uh, myself, John, and Tanya, we've been yeah. blasting the wire for multi-factor everything. There is also a use, very useful website. I'll put it in the podcast note to understand which company actually is supporting multi-factor yeah. and which company is not. And we complain about for a lot of companies. Some of them took actions. Some of them completely ignore the thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at someone like uh, Amazon, that's not um, enabled by default, but also they don't, uh, well, obviously they don't store the CVV, but um, they don't require the CVV to be re-entered every time you order. So, But it's it's an interesting... That's a, that's a, a risk-based... Um, it's a risk-based decision. Yeah. So that, that's where I want to take you because I had this conversation with a few people and somebody just... I had I had a very strong opinion say that's wrong that's wrong it's, and well, at a certain point I I took my head and I spin it around and I said what if I think about uh, usability and you know quickness of access yeah. and things like that they took uh, they took a conscious decision to yeah. say we look at the bar and we will respond to it in a very very quick and uh, reactive way but we want people to adopt this platform as much as they can yeah. I so mean, it was a conscious decision let's face it it runs on the a- aws right <laughs> i mean that's where <laughs> aws came from aws yes. aws is a secure platform you know the stuff people put on aws is not necessarily secure and but, how they configure but, it and how they configure it but aws itself is a very secure platform and so they obviously know what they're talking about. They obviously have, you know, good experience, good SMEs, etc. So when they do something that is as um, blindingly obvious to us infosec professionals as not enabling two FA and not having, um, uh, not asking for a CVV to be re-entered to confirm that the card is, you know, is still in your possession, etc., they're doing that for a very good reason. Yeah, you know, it's a risk-based exercise. Yeah, the amount of money they would lose by switching, by changing that, is obviously far greater than the amount of money they lose from fraud. Yeah, and I think that's that's the key thing for any kind of CISO and the key mindset shift <clears throat> from a secure, pure security professional that says wrong, 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 or the new generation of security professional that try to go through the part of a risk-based exercise to the real CISO, the board member that says, part of cash here, security risk here, let's balance it and let's see which one actually wins. And if the part of cash wins, so we need to make business win because ultimately everybody needs to be employed by a company that makes money. It's about Um, the business. It's not about about security. I was was fairly senior in the IT world when... <clears throat> Excuse me. When I um, moved into security, so I, I I started and built and led a team in security. And my, for about the first eighteen months to two years, I was very much of that old school of security must win. Security is correct. You must do what we say because it is the right thing to do. And it's a very it's it's a very easy and logical trap to fall into. It's um, comforting. It's, security it's comf- profession is comforting. You know exactly, you know, security is black and white. You know, it's either secure or it isn't, you know, and we don't want it to not be secure, therefore it has to be secure. It took me two years to, you know, get over myself. And I know there's, and that was fairly quick because of the organisation I was in at the time. It was a very flexible, fast-moving, creative environment. Um, plus the fact, you know, my that was around about the time that I was engaging with um, the industry as well. But, you know, it amazes me. It amazes me still to this day that there are large tranches of people who still think like that. Who there is no flexibility whatsoever in their viewpoint of of security. So, when was it the pivotal moment that made you realize, ah, I need to consider rest? That there was an event for, an event moment that made you completely change your mindset, or the light bulb moment. <clears throat> I don't know about. A light bulb moment, but a, there was definitely a time when I recognised that there was a balance to be had. When and it was to do with physical security, interesting enough. Although you know, but the principles apply. But we were considering putting in uh, barriers into the into the uh, reception of the office, and um, this particular the, the the managing director basically, said, I don't want barriers because our cafeteria, which was like a very fancy cafeteria where you could go for meetings and stuff like that cafeteria is just off reception he said i don't want people to have barriers i want them to be able to check into reception walk through into the cafe you know be very relaxed i want it you know i want it to flow 
I want mm-hmm. things to flow. And I'm thinking at the time, I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. It's, you know, I'm not sure about this. And then one of his colleagues, one of his senior colleagues said um, about the doors going into the various floors because they were all secured and on access control and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, and during the daytime, we should open all the doors as well so we can have all the creativity. And this this managing director looked at him and said, don't be so stupid. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and that that for me was, okay, he gets it. He gets the balance between, yes, we have a business to run. Yes, we have to, you know, there's a perception we want to present to our clients and who the, who we are as a company. But there is a balance between yeah. that and just throwing open the kimono and letting everybody, you know, come in and out as, as, as far as as far as and wide as they want to. So um, he did a risk assessment exercise yeah, and he said, absolutely. And he said and it, this is but that's this that's what, acceptable. That's what got me. And it that was very specific to that particular example. Another company would say we absolutely have to have barriers. But for me it was, you know, okay, the person obviously understands security, but his risk appetite is obviously far higher than actually on the ground floor you know where the doors to the working areas are still secured but not the cafe etc can remain open um but actually not so risk um you know risk happy that is happy enough to throw open the rest of the Uh, doors everything else yeah exactly so that 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 was a really um that was a, a bit of a moment for me because actually just finding that balance was the right thing so it wasn't zero trust network. It was no. It was there was still the perimeter. No, I'm <laughs> sorry, I had to throw it in there. No, I'd love you know zero trust. I'd love to have zero trust, but um, there's only one company I know that's actually done it completely, um, and that was a uh, one of the subsidiary of Google who was set up to show that zero trust works. So, so the people zero- the people that built you know that that built it and want to market it are the only company that have managed to set it up and only in the subsidiary that was able to build it and market it you know well uh, this is a good example it's, you know it, lead by example small example is a proof of concept it's a good white paper like, to be honest with you and it's a good you know, for want of a better term it's a good good example a good thing to aim for but there is so much security debt in virtually every single organization that to go to zero trust is a is a decade in the making, in my in my humble opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I hear, I hear people, and and I fall sometimes myself on 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 the topic of sexy security topic, yeah. and then the basic is is flow. Like, uh, yeah, you, you can build the wall as high and as strong as you want, <clears> and <throat> then there is a ransomware that hits you from the back door, and yeah. then you completely gone. Your business is gone. Yeah, or the or the whole zero trust thing, and it's like, okay, but well, how do we print? You know, or something stupid like that. Do you know what I mean? How do, you know, okay, well, the account department can't now de- connect to, you know, the payroll. Anything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know. or, or, yeah, we're completely zero trust apart from accounts because we don't trust them. And do you know what I mean? It's a, you know, and, and they all sit in their offices anyway until now when they're all sitting elsewhere. You know. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. We actually got forced to almost zero trust because effectively yeah. we were all on internet. Yeah, that's so right. So either, either we have a very strong perimeter, but uh, the attack surface right now is everywhere. I, th- I think I think probably we've reduced the period. When I said it would take about a decade to go from your average company to zero trust, we've probably reduced that time frame by about two years in the space of three months mm. because people have had to you know, instead of I'm um, in an iron about it for 18 months and go, oh, would it work? Would it not? They've suddenly they've had to make it work. Now they're probably a lot more open to to that sort of thing and the flexibility it would bring. But nonetheless, you know, it's such a massive change. You know, especially when you've invested so much in hardware and you know architecture and environments. And then everything changed. And then everything changed. And then in 10 years' time, you know, it won't be zero trust. It'll be negative one trust or something <laughs> like that. You know. <laughs> That's, that's my no, prediction, I think, I think, folks, for, for 2030. They changed, they changed the name. they changing Gaia or something like that. It started like mm. Zero Trust or Project Zero, yes, and then that's it right. got renamed in Gaia from, I think. Is it the X Men? I don't X-Men? remember anymore. Forest. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the Avengers. The Avengers. <laughs> I know that character. I know that character. Yeah. yeah. The one in the bright <laughs> spandex, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful picture and for the audience. Absolutely. Imagine, us in imagine it. Just imagine it, folks. 
<laughs> but it's no trust. Yeah. It's invisible. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Clear your mind, Francesco. It's uh, you know, stop thinking about me in the spandex. I know it's difficult. It's I know it's difficult, but but anyway, to apply zero trust, do you have to be CISP certified, and do you need to have a master? Ah, lovely, <laughs> lovely. Let's get the nomenclature correct. It's CISSP. Um, okay, that's not the ISC squared uh, version of it, but it's certainly the host unknown version of uh, what a CISSP is. But uh, yeah, don't get me started on this. So. I am not one of the people with pitchforks when it, you know, pitchforks and torches when it comes to the CIWSP is a, is a master's. Because I think people, well, one, classic internet, people looked at the headline, took offense, and decided that they knew everything that was going on about it. Uh, two, I think ISC Squared didn't, didn't actually do their press release particularly well. Um, and three, Folks, please just get over yourselves here. You know, okay, you, we've all worked very hard for your masters, just as, you know, some people have not worked very hard for their masters and got it anyway. And some people have worked very hard, hard for their CRWSPs, and some people have been on a five day boot camp. You can tell the difference when you actually meet them, right? Yeah. But most importantly, and I think this, you know, the, the devil is in the detail, or rather, you know, the reality is when you actually read what it's about, not just the headline, is that it's an equivalence, not it's not the same. And it's equivalence that is in the UK and Europe, it's aimed at allowing um, educational establishments and employers to work out where people are in their careers. So, for instance, if an employer was to say we need someone with into, a master's degree. With a master's degree, they can see somebody with a CRWSP and think, okay, that should be acceptable as well. They have studied, they have taken an exam, and unlike a master's, they have done continuing education every yeah, year true. for the last however long, you know, 10 years for 10 years plus for many people. Whereas the you master's have to put the practice. Yeah, the master's that you took 15 years ago isn't relevant anymore. You know, and you know who knows if you've even worked on it, but you're still allowed to put the letters after your name, right? But anyway, um, but uh, I digress. But the um, the other the other <laughs> thing is, God, I'm looking like Trump here. Yeah. But the other thing, the, the with these very fine CIWSP people, everybody says so. Um, <clears throat> it should be tiny hands. Would be the best. Would be the best. It's the best master's equivalent. But um, the um. <laughs> The other thing is academic institutions when, you know, when you're trying to get on to, you know, trying to go into further education, um, it will it carries a certain amount of credit that allows... You can recognise. So I it, think that's exactly. important, recognising the certification, not redoing the same topic over and over, but actually continuing that I see in a lot of master on cybersecurity. Well, I have a CCNA. Yeah, but you need to redo the networking. Hmm. I already know that stuff, but you still need to do it. So it's... And, I don't know. Yeah, two things come out of this for me. You know, one, calm down, Karen. How is this really going to affect you? Is it? Does it really affect you? In you know, do, has your masters diminished in any way, shape, or form? No, it hasn't, except in your mind. And two, don't tell us about the blood, sweat, and tears you put into this because I know a lot of people into a masters because I know a lot of people who put blood, sweat, and tears into the CIWSP and into getting their their C, um, CPEs every year. It's it's difficult. It's a pain in the bum, etc. Um, you have to do it. You have to do we it. We have to do it lose. exactly. Yeah. And and what what alternative is there? You know, we we move forward. We look at you know we look we try and compare the two. We try and make sure that they're recognised in similar with similar audiences. This is the way it goes. So. You know, just just this is the way. chill out, folks. <laughs> chill out. Sorry. It's okay. Calm down. You know the the um the sky isn't falling. Um, but anyway. certification is certification. We should. Yeah. I mean, I was I was discussing with Greg uh, probably a few podcasts ago. Greg Van der Gas. Yeah. That let's get away from certification. I know that recruiter have challenge because they look at the skills of a person and say, does it have this, this, and that. And then specific organization need to 
if you want to enroll on specific program like the AWS Partner and so on, only if they have a number of certified people. And it's an industry that fit itself because I was an ex Microsoft and Cisco trainer, so I know how things work. Yeah. But certification for the sake of certification is pointless, but also they're not completely useless. They are expensive, yeah. but they're not useless. But they're... education for the sake of education is useless. Correct. Just because you did, you went on to a master's because you didn't fancy leaving university and you wanted another year we cut price beer at the university doesn't make it valuable to you. It doesn't mean that you, you've actually taken something from it. In many cases... It will, but it it doesn't necessarily follow. They're as valid and as useful as you make them and as you know and as you present them. And here's the thing, here's a scenario where it would work where it works in everybody's favor. If um employers and you know hiring organizations are now thinking, okay, so a CIWSP is the equivalent of a master's. So therefore, when I ask for an entry level position with five years experience and a CISP, CIWSP. What I'm actually asking for is a master, a master. <laughs> someone who has been out of university for five years with a master's for an entry level position. So that level of equivalency actually may allow them to say, maybe insisting on a CIWSP is too much. And hopefully that conversation will start to happen. But let, let's extend uh, OWSCP and uh, the various yeah. the ver- various fine pen testing bloody hard or or um the ccie for cisco advanced networking or advanced security they're bloody hard yeah and expensive so let's not put those as a as a blocker to hire people hire people by the skill and train them internally because certifications are great you know to a certain extent if they're taken right i mean i we never used to when i was hiring you know uh in my ciso job um i we never used to look at certifications as a prerequisite. If you had them, then great. We'll ask questions about them and all you know, all that sort of thing. If you don't have them, well, come with us. We'll we'll train you on the job, etc. And after a certain period of time, when you've sort of shown you're committed, you know, basically when you pass a probation, effectively, mm-hmm. what we then did was we will pay for all the study materials. We'll pay for the exam. Um, we'll allow you to take time off uh, for the exam and a few days. Um, the week before but you know study in your own time but we'll pay everything for you to to go and do it that's a fair one and then if you beat my score in the exam i (laughs) I take you out for dinner that's a good one that's a good one yeah exactly exactly so well that's a good incentive actually on the subject of incentive yeah exactly and it became a bit of fun yeah absolutely absolutely but i love gamification but a very informal way of doing it you know, so um, I, I mean, I was just glad for the company when I went for dinner, but you know, but it was, um, <laughs> but it was seen as something that cemented your, the knowledge that you already had. Do you know what I mean? Rather than um, a, a gatekeeper or a gate, you know, a gateway to getting the job in the first place. And and that's a brilliant point, Tom. I I can't agree more that effectively you do something and then you solidify because. Yeah. It's pointless if you have if you're certified in cloud and you never you never spin up uh, an instant an easy two instance or you never play around with a pass instance you never touch the cloud but yeah. you're certified yeah so exactly certification. exactly and, and it takes me back to the master because on the master you kind of book smart not street smart <laughs> yeah yeah and and in fairness the masters is a little bit more vocational than say the average degree you know because Correct. it's they're very often sponsored by a you know a, a company if if you're you know slightly more older in years but uh, but but again you could go, have gone to, you know and even i back in the uh, whew, the early 90s considered um when i left university to carry on and do a masters uh, except my degree wasn't very good. I I, I only got a third class degree, folks. Um, you know, on, on, don't on, tell on anyone. That, on that subject, actually, what do you think about now all the university going online? And before all the university that were online, a master online was slacked off. Was like, yeah, there's a second or third class degree. And now yeah. Cambridge and Oxford are going online and saying, well, now is is a first degree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the Open University was entirely uh, online, wasn't it? Um, it, it still is. Yeah, I think exactly. You just need to do the exam uh, on have, premises. You have, you have to sit down somewhere. That's right. But um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, 
well, again, like the workplace, I think we're seeing a watershed in attitudes towards things like video conferencing and, you know, meeting, you know, having larger meetings over Zoom. And, you, you know, I think, I think um, it, it's shaking up every level of society to a certain extent. You know, I, I, I'd love to see the stats for things like iMessage and FaceTime and SMS and Zoom and all that sort of stuff. Oh, we saw we saw the stats on Zoom. The Zoom are like yeah, they, they, they increase massively. They increases massively yeah. uh, the usage. But from that, I love the fact that I had a friend of mine that discovered one of the big bugs, one of the remote code execution bugs, and the CIO responded personally to him instead of slacking him off and attacking him. Is and saying, Zoom? Thank you. Well, yeah. We'll fix it. Oh, okay. Because I, I must admit, I, I, my view of Zoom, and I have to be careful because we're on Zoom at the moment, so they might be listening. But uh, <laughs> my view of Zoom is was that because um, it was when they were selling your data to Facebook. That was that was when I first really came across it because I, I I've not hadn't used Zoom up until that point. Um, and I, I felt that any company any company that knowingly sold your data to Facebook without overtly telling you that they were doing it. I mean, it may have been buried somewhere in, you know, some teasing. In the no list. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> but any company that was doing that had a very shaky ethical standing, in my opinion. So when there were some security issues that came out, I, I basically just said to everyone that I knew, see, I told you, bad company, very dodgy, et cetera, et cetera. But... I'm increasingly, you know, recently they they completely reviewed everything and addressed a whole bunch of security bugs and they're responding and that they've been extreme, you know, very very responsive around. Um, and the communication has been amazing. Yeah, so so maybe I don't know. Either I'm wrong, which of course is very unlikely, or maybe there's been a. a ch- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I just need to remove the egos in front say of the camera. Did I say something funny? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but or, or there has been a change in philosophy at the organisation, and if so, I think that's that's very laudable. So, you know, I'd certainly, I, I would certainly be um, looking out that little bit more to sort of see what kind of company they are now. You know, so. Um, uh, well, I yeah. was I was positively impressed by the way they addressed the issues, by the velocity and agility and and quickness and and the fact that they said, "Yeah, fair enough, we'll fix it." Yeah, fair enough, we'll fix it. Not just uh, they handle the communication perfectly and they sustain in a world that is at the moment video conferencing. And I think they had a very good stand right now because the product is everywhere. Well, it it's easy and it works. Apart from yeah. this one, folks, we had to try four times to connect before this call. You know, I think there, so- was, there, was, there was the caveat that we were on Boom before, yeah. so yeah. I, I was particularly I, careful. Oh, right, okay. Okay, is that why the password changed three times? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Zoom knew it was me coming on. <laughs> but that's actually a point. So even the most careful individual can make mistakes. So. If we can make mistake, I imagine. I mean, I was in the, in a chat with one of my mentees, and she said we had constantly on on our university our Zoom call are getting bombed with people saying all sort of thing or displaying all sort of things. So, shall we start establishing the Zoom police? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or 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 name the individual that kick people off or yeah. or, or report people off. Yeah. That's so right. I think that's. It's, it's a completely different world where everybody now is on, on video and those are crimes. Those are the crimes in the same way. What we need is an AI-powered bot that uses the blockchain to ascertain who is online and who should be there and who shouldn't be there so it can then screw up and kick the wrong people off. But, you know. <laughs> I think you use all the perfect words. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Hashtag buzzword. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you think you need blockchain, you've asked the wrong question. <laughs> and you're still addressing yeah. the wrong technology. <laughs> exactly. And what, and what was the other one? Um, if it's machine learning, it's written in Python. If it's AI, it's written in PowerPoint. No, it's written in sprinkles because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't exist. Yeah. 
I, I, I was having a chat with uh, the responsible of God and I said I was doing AI before AI was invented and it was just machine learning or statistics. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's another password names. Yeah. But it sells. I mean, it, I was having a conversation with um, ITSP podcast on password and I said, I am schizophrenic on them because on one point I hate them and one point I love it because when you have a conversation and you start putting certain words, certain people put them in buckets. Yeah. So if they heard them, they're more positively accepting the conversation. So if if a CIO is keep on asking blockchain, 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 and you can sell a program that has just the word blockchain in it and it's going to make your accept the budget, yeah. why not? It's like, yeah, yeah we're going to try this machine learning on our log for reason that I still don't know, but still give me the budget for it. But have you not just summed up everything that is wrong with our industry in just those couple of sentences? It is. Yeah, but let's buy thing- something because the CEO said he heard his friend at the golf club say blockchain. I know, but uh, there, there is one thing that is criticizing, one thing just going with it yeah it's like just just having a word <laughs> of a, a religious I, i'm not accepting religious war so sometimes you had to just put down your sword and just accepting that you're dealing with people that don't want to do bloody security yeah. all right maybe there was a jesus <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying that maybe there wasn't and by the way the earth isn't flat Okay, I think we said it though. <laughs> I think uh, it, it was a pleasure. I think we we run complete almost all, all on time, and time with you flies. And it's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you, Tom. But before I let you go, yeah. uh, can you give a very considering we are in grim time sometimes, and we will be for a little while? Can you give a positive message about life or cybersecurity or whatever you want? Oh, a positive message about cybersecurity. Um... I tell you, one of my one of my favourites is uh, I I would say a positive message, but you know, kind of like a, an establishing mes- message is uh, if if you're a CISO and your job isn't PowerPoint and politics, then you're probably just ahead of IT security. Ouch! <laughs> that's harsh, like sandpaper, but that's why we love you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so where, where can we bring it, folks? Can bring we... it. <laughs> <laughs> Where can we see you next? Oh, um, so uh, the lockdown has get, has uh, strummed up a, a lot of sort of online work. So uh, I'm working with the, the folks with Host Unknown. We're doing um, a, a weekly podcast. Uh, my um, series of The Lost CISO, which are the little short films that I've done, that's just released the first episode of the second season this week. Um, nice. And each episode is going to have an accompanying blog come out uh, on the Wednesday. So the blog came out today. Um, and yeah, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, at Tom Langford, um, website, tl2security.com. Um, yeah, just... Uh, uh, and I'll put everything in, in the note of the podcast so people and folks can can jump on it. Absolutely. And if you want to know why I say CISP rather than CISP, um, we can also put the link for that in as well. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Share the links to all this stuff. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Tom. It's a lovely conversation. Lovely. Thank you, Francesco. <laughs> See ya. Bye. And be- bye-bye, folks from Zoom. <laughs> everybody so much for listening i hope you enjoy the content i hope you enjoy the website please follow us uh, on linkedin on social media on youtube uh, but most important visit www.cybersecuritycloudpodcast.com for the latest podcast uh, give us a like on social media give us a, a follow on youtube uh, or any other platform where you listen to this podcast i really appreciate your time And this is your host, Francesco. Stay cyber safe, so we are all cyber happy. Thank you.